Okay, everyone, welcome to the Open Education Southern Symposium um, Open Ed Week webinar. Uh, this is Stephanie Pierce, uh, head of the Physics Library here at the Physics Library in the University of Arkansas. I want to welcome all our attendees and our presenters. Um, we're extremely happy to be doing this. It's our second event. Our first one was last fall. Uh, here on the campus, and we wanted to expand the event to the web to invite more people on. So we have three presentations today. Uh, let me advance my screen. Uh, each presentation will be about 55 minutes, uh, including q and A. I'm asking all questions for the presenters to be submitted through the chat box. It should be available. The chat box should be on your right hand side of your screen down there. Um, if you don't see it, um, please just raise your hand and let me know. Between each presentation, we will have a five minute break to allow people to go to the restroom, log in for the other ones, leave, um, and set up. So, to get started, we have Carrie Gitz from Austin Community College, and I will switch over to her. Are you there, Terry? Implementations, and it really is a story, and it's one that is not complete. Um, we are still writing the story. So, as I had my brain at one of the ACC campuses, I've been involved with this initiative since it started in 2016, when we were uh, one of the recipients of the Achieving the Dream. OER degree initiative grant, and uh, through my work at ACC, I have supported uh, faculty who were involved in the grant, uh, supported librarians, getting them up to speed on um, open education and open educational resources, um, helping, again, the faculty find, vet, evaluate, but also serving as a member of the cross-district uh, cross team for the OER work group, um, supporting uh, staff across the college and faculty helped get this initiative off the ground. So it's both kind of my perspective from uh, being on the work group and being involved with the grant and also being the, uh, one of the lead librarians um, about for this project. So I thought I would start with a little bit of um, keeping with the literary theme, uh, a brief forward or introduction to who we are at Austin Community College. Um, we opened our doors in 1973. Um, we're located in Central Texas in the Austin, uh, Austin area. Um, a two-year college which serves uh, workforce certificate and transfer programs. We recently launched a BSN program uh, this fall. We, are a, we have 11 campuses within our district, and we are a one-district college with a central administration. So even though we have 11 campuses, um, we are a, a single administration college. Some of the images that you see in front of you are from one of our uh, relatively new campuses, the Highland Campus, which is where I am located. And this is an old mall that uh, the college purchased and has renovated. Um, and you see pictures of our large accelerator, which is an open learning concept space of our classroom and individual work, um, and 604 computers in that area. Our focus of uh, a lot of the uh, work at ACC is on student success and providing affordable and flexible learning pathways for our students. Um, when we consider our online students, our adult basic education, dual credit, early high school students, part-time and full-time, our enrollment is about 70,000 students annually. Our 11 campuses cover six different counties. Uh, in Central Texas, and it's a little over nine taxing districts. So we have students who move among our campuses, um, and with that one district uh, central, with well, that one district administration concept, um, students do move among and expect the same services at our various campuses. Um, we are certified as a Hispanic serving institution, and you can see a little bit of our demographic uh, makeup of our students. 
much of what we strive for and, and do at ACC is centered around um, some both local and uh, statewide uh, policy context. So, for example, the Texas Higher Education uh, Coordinating Board has a goal, 60 by 30 Texas, that says that by 2030, 60% of Texans aged 24 to 34 will have a post-secondary certificate. Um, Austin, the ACC also supports the Austin Master Community Workforce Plan, and that helps drive uh, what our strategic plan as a college is centered around. And so our four goals for our strategic plan focus on equity and access, persistence and engagement, completion and transition to transfer employment, and um, effective and efficient operations and infrastructure. And open educational resource and uh, textbook affordability issues across uh, several of those, including equity and access and persistence and engagement, and, and, as well as completion and transition to transfer. So now that you know who we are and where we are and, and how big Austin Community College is, I want to start with our story of how we got started. Um, I think it's important to understand that before 2016, we had a handful of uh, faculty across the district who had been using open educational resources for a number of years. So our early adopters, um, there were pockets of them across the college. Um, they had been using both openly licensed resources and freely available resources like library resources um, for the learning materials. But there was no coordinated um, initiative or overarching program. So we really got started um, when we participated or were a recipient of the Achieving the Dream OER degree initiative grant, which allowed us to develop these OER degree pathways. And if you're not familiar with the grant, um, here's a little bit about the background of that. Uh, the Achieving the Dream OER Degree Initiative Grant was awarded to 38 uh, community colleges, and Texas ACC was one of those 38. We actually went into the grant as a consortium with three other community colleges in Texas, Alamo College, El Paso, and San Jacinto Community College. And with the consortium idea um, and some of the shared uh, course numbering systems, as well as some of the uh, shared learning outcomes across the colleges, we felt that it was important for us to sort of share the workload, and each of the colleges participated in the consortium in developing and reviewing the courses so that we could uh, move towards the degree pathway. And we chose the uh, general studies degree pathway for an associate of arts and an associate of science. Each of the institutions in our consortium were awarded about $75,000 uh, to achieve uh, the grant, to complete the requirements. The focus of the grant was on adoption of open educational resources. Um, so the Lumen Learning was a partner, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but the focus was on adoption. Um, there was some creation that had to happen, so we had a couple of courses at ACC. Um, that did not exist as an open educational resource course. So, for example, example Texas government um, was one of the courses that ACC was involved in creating from the ground up. Um, we were also a research partner in the grant, so we were able to gather um, some additional data about our student participation and um, success rates with grades and um, effectiveness of that as well. A requirement of the grant was that all of the course material uh, adopted and created uh, would be shared openly. Um, the default was the CC BY license, and there was um, some material, there were some exceptions to that, but the default was to have it shared openly with using a CC BY license. And it is all available, um, again, through the Lumen Learning was the technology partner, and so the courses that were um, developed and created are um, available from Lumen's site, and I'll show you an example of that as well. If any of you are interested in learning more about the, um, the Achieving the Dream OER uh, initiative, they have two reports that they have published at their website. They are easily accessible, um, and one of them was an early snapshot from June of 2017 that looked at sort of the emerging lessons uh, that we all were learning as we were um, launching this program. And then the second one was just released in June, uh, this June of 2018, um, which looked at some of the uh, data that we collected from the, the participating research partners and the students' experiences and also the financial impact on an initiative like this um, at our institution. 
So how did we get to where we are today? And I think it's important to start with um, our evolution story and sort of how we put it all together. Um, and so we'll look at some of the highlights of from 2016 to now. We have officially branded um, our degree as the Z degree. And as I mentioned before, we are following the uh, Associate of Science and Associate of Arts in General Studies. So those are our two degree pathways that we have available where students can essentially take all of their uh, their required courses and elective courses taking uh, in classes that use open educational resource. So the idea that they would never have to purchase a textbook for the entire degree pathway. Um, we are using the terminology OER and GPC, uh, zero textbook cost, and I'll talk more about definitions and branding a little later on. So if we start with one of our initial chapters when we launched um, the grant from 2016 to 2017, again, keeping in mind that we had no established OER large-scale initiative going on at APC. So when the grant was awarded to us in May of 2016, we had to ramp up fairly quickly um, to get all of this rolling. And again, I think that was the benefit of some of the consortium work is that, that we had shared um, partners across different colleges to um, help facilitate some of this. But over the summer, you know, we worked, um, uh, some of the administrators and department chairs worked to recruit faculty in the various departments across the college to um, find out who was interested or who might be willing to participate in that. Through the grant, we were able to offer stipends and course release time for the course developers and stipends for the course reviewers. The librarians and instructional designers participated in uh, training faculty on everything from open pedagogy to open licensing and just the basic concepts of what open educational resources are. There was also some time spent on learning the Lumen platform and, of course, understanding all the other grant requirements um, that the faculty had to follow in terms of mapping their resources, getting them approved and vetted um, through Lumen so that they could appear um, in their platform. So that was all happening in the summer and the fall of 2016, and by the spring of 2017, we were able to launch our first 29 OER sections across the college. When we initially launched, because we were a research partner, um, we kept the sections at a handful. We kept them, I think, at three of our campuses. Um, and I mentioned, because of being a research partner, we were trying to have some control sites. Um, so campuses that had no OER sections and campuses that had more OER sections so we could do some comparisons among the students. That also impacted how we were able to advertise and promote. So at this point, while the classes were being offered, we weren't doing a lot of branding and marketing um, surrounding the courses. Something else significant that happened during our first chapter of our um, evolution or, or implementation was that Texas Senate Bill 810 was passed in June of 2017, and I'll talk more about that. Um, we were able to survey our students in the fall of 2017, so kind of after about two semesters, three semesters of offering classes. And then we continued to develop courses and review courses so that more could be added um, to the schedule. So this is kind of a current running list, a broad representation of the courses across the discipline that we have offered as zero textbook costs or OER classes. And again, most of these were, um, actually all of these were part of the uh, degree initiatives and fulfill some of the requirements of the general studies uh, degree pathways. The courses I mentioned were created in the Lumen Learning Platform. And so if any of you are interested in finding these um, at Lumen Learning site, uh, you can uh, go under the community the community catalog for courses, and there is a link to the Achieving the Dream courses, and you can filter by institution and also by discipline. So if you were to click on Austin Community College, uh, you could see the courses uh, that were created uh, for by us uh, under the grant. Our implementation and evolution story also included definitely an increase in our sections. You can see um, from the spring of 2017, the steady increase of students that were enrolled, as well as the number of sections that we were able to offer. I mentioned we started with 29 sections. 
We are currently at over 400 sections across the uh, various campuses being offered as VPC OER course sections, and we have over 9,000 students enrolled, close to 10,000, I believe. So because we are a research partner, um, we have some additional data, and I think uh, I'm just going to share some of the information um, as it's relevant to sort of our, our, our evolution story and things that we need to look at. Um, and most of the data is representative of the 2018 survey, but I did include some 2017 um, statistics in here. So if you – the survey looked at a couple of things. It looked at student spending habits on textbooks, um, their awareness of open educational resources, and then we were also able to pull um, some information about their grades and withdrawal rates as well. So if you think about um, their habits in terms of um, spending, um, you could see that 40% of our students actually uh, initially purchased a used or print textbooks, so the online digital rental was actually quite low, um, and the, even the print rental was lower than the used, uh, um, the used print uh, purchasing. You can see that our students, um, I think it's interesting to point out that uh, they didn't often purchase a required textbook in 2017. 48% said it was because they couldn't afford it, and that number dropped significantly in 2018 to 21%. And I would like to say that Open Educational Resources, UTC, um, had an impact on that. I think we still need to look a little bit closer at the data. But when the question was asked why they didn't purchase it, in 2018, 42% of the students said that it was because it was free and available online. And the majority of our students that answered the survey uh, for these classes did say that, on average, they spent um, about $100 to $150 a semester on course materials. I mentioned that this survey, we were also able to compare um, some, uh, some grade rates and other, um, other data. Um, I pointed some of these out because I think it's interesting if you are looking at the first couple of bullets and then you look down at the awareness question. Um, so some of these questions ask, ask about whether or not the students perceived the teaching uh, to be the same or higher quality or whether they felt more engaged with the learning materials. We don't see a huge jump in whether or not students felt that the teaching was um, significantly better. Um, but I think it's also uh, important to point out that if you look at the last question, 74% of our students didn't know that they were registered for an open class uh, or a UTC class at the time of registration. And surprisingly, 39% of the students didn't know that they were in an OER UTC class until they were taking the survey and actually asked the question. So I would like to think that with more awareness, um, uh, from the students on what VTC OER is, um, not just on the cost-saving aspects, but how it can engage them in their learning, um, that some of these numbers would change and that we would actually see a higher rate um, in the quality of teaching, um, their perception of the quality of teaching and their engagement uh, with the material. So I think um, those numbers um, can fluctuate over time, um, but again, I think the awareness uh, clearly shows some, some areas that we need to involve evolved in. We did find through our, through our data that um, when we compared across all five semesters, there was consistent improvement in the grade rates in, in most of the OER course sections, um, specifically in history, chemistry, and biology. Um, not every single individual class had improvement um, from an OER versus non-OER class, but again, there was consistent improvement across all five semesters um, in, the, in the grade levels for students enrolled in OVR course sections. Um, we also found that our, our rates for withdrawal was lower in the OER course section. So that's representative of some of the other um, national data uh, that is out there relating to open educational resource classes. I mentioned that um, part of our evolution story uh, revolved around some things that happened in 2017, one of those being Texas Bill Senate 810, which was state legislation that was signed into law relating to open educational resources. And that law had three main components that um, impacted institutions of higher education. One, that it was the state created a statewide OER grant program. 
to uh, create grant opportunities for faculty to create open educational resources. And I'm proud to say that uh, one ACC faculty member was awarded one of those grants and is working on developing um, an open educational resource in uh, literature. The other aspect of the law uh, focused on establishing protocols for OER course designations and course catalogs. So essentially making these courses discoverable and find, being able for students to find them when they went to register, looked in the course schedule, and even in the bookstore holdings um, for, their, for their course material. So making sure that students could identify that these courses were zero textbook cost and being taught with open educational resources. The third aspect was um, money put forward to uh, create a statewide feasibility study that looked at the possibility of a statewide repository. And two of these, both the grant program and the statewide um, repository, there is additional proposed legislation happening right now that would add additional funds for another round of grant programs and then also uh, to continue with the uh, repository. Uh, the suggestion to move forward was to um, create an OER Commons hub to locate the Texas-related uh, statewide repository for open educational resources. So we're waiting um, anxiously to hear if, if that will go forward. But one of the biggest impacts that this law had was uh, the aspect of course designations. And so we knew that we had to do this at some point, but I think putting this um, into legislation was sort of a helped us move it forward a little bit faster, and we relied because it was a statewide, there was a lot of questions going back and forth how people were implementing this um, and various systems and institutional um, policies and procedures uh, have a definite impact on making that possible. So if you're not familiar with um, those of you that have state legislation related to this, um, Take a look at uh, OER librarian Michelle Reed, a person from the University of Texas at Arlington, and she created this wonderful resource for us in Texas that is highlighting um, sort of how to make this happen at your institution, um, some examples of the various uh, systems, what it might look like to the student, but also how to have those conversations at your institution, how to make it happen, who needs to be involved from IT to um, the registrar, individual faculty, department chairs, so it's a great resource um, for everyone. So now that we've evolved, I'm happy to say this is where we are today in 2019. Uh, we can say that we have uh, two uh, Z degree pathways. We have the general studies in Associate of Arts and the general studies in Associate of Science um, program maps available and, and students are working towards them. There's been conversations about additional Z degrees, such as in business or communication. Um, we have uh, over 30,000 students since 2016 have enrolled in OER courses. We currently have 39 individual OER courses, and that's about 400 OER course sections across our 11 campuses. And as of spring of 2019, we have 157 faculty members who are faculty members who are teaching with open educational resources. And our cost savings is a little over $3 million, uh, to date. Our, our cost savings, we did the $100 uh, sort of general number. We did some individual looking at the data and, and looking at some of the individual costs of current and used uh, textbooks. But for the $3 million, we did use that $100 um, average number. But in looking at some of the more granular data, we were able to discover that our biggest cost savings was for uh, the textbook in cultural anthropology, where it was initially $264, and um, the faculty had adopted uh, the openly licensed uh, textbook for that class. Our largest department for OER adoption has been our student development department. We have a... Um, a student, a college success course called EDUC, EDUC 1300, which is effective learning strategies that um, students take as they um, embark into their college career. And so one of the faculty members that was participating in uh, the course creation for this grant created the Open Educational Resource uh, Effective Learning Strategy, and that is available uh, actually in OER Commons currently as well. And so her department has largely adopted, um, most of the sections have gone uh, OER for using this resource. 
So now it's 2019. Um, we have implemented, we have evolved, and um, our grant is coming to an end. I think our final report is due either this month or next month. Um, so it is time for us. Uh, we have been thinking about it, but, um, you know, thinking about where do we go from here and how do we expand and sustain um, what we've built. And I think um, I'm going to talk a little bit about this quote, but um, I think first and foremost with a large initiative like this, what we learned, and this quote is borrowed from uh, faculty and OER, faculty member and OER coordinator, uh, Tondra Connerly at San Jacinto College. I over heard her say this in a presentation in open ed in the fall, and she actually said OER promotion happens at the front door to the back door at an institution, but I think one of the lessons that we've learned at ACC is that in a large initiative like this, OER anything happens at the front door to the back door. So that could be OER promotion, OER support, OER work, understanding, championing those that are involved, awareness, sustainability. So it really is an opportunity for every department in the college to be involved and have their doors open to this. And that includes, you know, the faculty who are creating and developing and teaching. It's the advisors um, that need to be aware so that they can uh, advocate for this and show their students where to find these classes upon registration. It's the schedulers and the curriculum development officers who are responsible for putting together that course schedule and all the annotations and notations. It's various parts of IT, making sure that there's infrastructure or things are happening within our various data systems, um, librarians and instructional designers, and then we have administrators, department chairs. I mean, the list goes on. You even have people um, that have been involved at ACC. We have the um, folks in our business, some of our business analysts in our business office that have helped us with running some of these numbers and cost-saving uh, aspects. We have our Office of Institutional Effectiveness and Accountability that has helped us with the data. Um, and then we have, of course, our marketing uh, departments that have helped us brand and get the word out about all of this. And, of course, first and foremost, we have our students, and I think um, that is something that we can't lose sight of, that that is who we are thinking of at, in all aspects of an OER initiative is that it's students student-centered and student-first. But again, keeping in mind that OER work happens across the institution, whether it's a small-scale initiative or something big like we did at ACC. So as our expansion story um, sort of continues, or as we continue to evolve, our evolution hasn't ended. Um, we are looking at, the, you know, our final courses were developed in, in 2018 um, and approved and vetted and made available uh, through the Loom Learning Platform. Um, we've added some additional courses beyond the grant at this at this point. Um, we've we've improved and we are continuing to improve the course marking and labeling. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about some transitions that we had to face last summer as we were sort of winding down with our grant participation and our course development and moving forward with where some of these course materials would be hosted and where they could be available for faculty to edit. And then we were able to do another student survey in the fall, so we have some comparison data from, again, 2017 and 2018. We've evolved with our marketing strategies and branding from OER to Z degree to ZTC OER and then really focusing on sustainability planning. So that's kind of what our chapter outline uh, currently looks like. So if we look at our cost savings across um, since 2016, when we really started offering the classes in the spring of 2017, again, we started with 29, uh, 29 sections. And in spring of 2019, we have over 400 sections across the college that are, that are offered with VTC OER. And so um, consistently our cost savings have gone up, and we've saved our students at ACC over, over $3 million, again, using that $100 um, average textbook cost. So I think here's a big piece of our, of, of our expansion story. And 
remembering that definitions matter. As we evolved and as we grew, um, thinking about what we call things internally and externally, um, the language on the slide that you see is taken from various pieces of uh, material that's on the ACC website from different departments or different articles that have gone out, um, information for faculty and for students. And I think we all need to think both in the, at ACC, uh, both internally and externally, thinking about how we call things and how we define things. Because for faculty, it's really important that they understand the difference between open and free. And teaching a VTC class with library license material versus teaching a VTC class with openly licensed material means you have permissions to do different things. And so for the faculty, it's important to understand um, that difference between open and free. Um, how we convey that to the student at this point, you know, that's yet to be determined, but using terminology that resonates with them. But then also thinking, again, internally to other, other people in the college. So how does, what does OBR ZTC mean to the schedulers, to department chairs, to the bookstore? What does it mean to um, the board of trustees, to administrators, and other stakeholders? So again, working on those definitions so that it makes sense to um, every person that is involved, um, but then also looking at the outward definition. And I, I mentioned students before, and if you remember back to an earlier slide where um, the students were surveyed about their awareness of whether or not they were aware that they were taking an open or a course using open educational resources or a UTC course, and 70, over 70% 70 said they weren't aware, 39% said they weren't aware until they took the survey. So to the student, you know, at this point, they know it's free. They don't have to buy a textbook. Um, but when we think about those definitions, you know, having the label of DTC slash OER, what does that mean to the student? Is there a way to convey not that they're just saving money, but for them to understand some of the other benefits uh, behind using openly licensed resources, how it can improve um, their experience in the classroom, their engagement with the material, um, their their instructors' uh, engagement with the material, and again, essentially their experience and success in the classroom. So what do we need to call it? How do we need to describe it to our students um, so that they understand and they see the benefit um, beyond the cost savings as well? So as thinking along that same line, um, I'm going to show some examples of how we currently have things identified in our system. And again, I think it's still a work in progress as we kind of work through that idea of definitions matter and how we define and label things. But as a student, if I am interested in going, uh, taking an, you know, taking a course using open educational resources or a zero textbook cost, I can go to the course schedule and by term I can search by instructor discipline, a variety of things, but one of the other sorts that I can look at is the um, Open Educational Resources Zero Textbook Cost. And if I were to click on that and then click on a particular course, each of the courses have a course note that says it is a ZTC class um, and that the in place of required textbooks, all textbook material needed for the class will be available online to the student free of charge. Students are responsible for printing their printing costs if they choose to print a copy. Um, and that the course may use open educational resources and then it tells them to go uh, to their syllabus or go to class for more information. Um, you'll see a link that says textbooks. One of the things that uh, we've been able to do and some of my colleagues uh, working, working on this very closely with the bookstore have been able to work with the bookstore. We are a Barnes & Noble College, so we've worked with them to create um, a generic ISDN so that when faculty, it's time for them to uh, select the course materials for the semester, um, they can enter, if they are teaching a, an OER ZTC course, they can enter this generic ISDN, and then what populates for the student is this note that says ZTC course. Again, what does that mean for the student? How do they understand what that is? It's still a work in progress for us. 
um, but it's better than what it used to be when, depending on what class you picked, that message was all over the map. So we're refining it, we're improving it, but um, I still think there's room for improvement on, on the labeling and, and definition part of all of this. If a student is in the registration system, um, they can, we use a colleague Illusion, which self-service is our registration system. And so a student can go in and they can select a course type filter. And again, in the registration system, we have them separated out. Um, so zero textbook costs and uh, open education resources. So again, it's not a perfect system, um, but we are working towards uh, improving this and streamlining it for students. And part of our, uh, something we did this week for Open Education Week was really getting the word out to students and having them participate in um, finding some of these courses and understanding um, what the open and zero textbook costs uh, meant for them. Also, as part of our uh, expansion story, we have really focused on um, using, uh, leaning into our marketing team, and we've gotten some external PR, uh, an article from the Austin Chronicle that you see, and also a lot of buzz just on ACC social media, as well as some internal ACC news articles that go out to faculty, staff, and students. Um, and so we've been really happy with uh, being able to, now that we're sort of out of the, the research mode and being able to only contain OER to certain campuses, um, to really launch um, the awareness campaign and get the student voice and perspective um, in sort of our next chapter of this. I think with any initiative, big or small, and especially as you continue to um, expand it or sustain it, um, recognizing the work that faculty do and our, you know, I love this quote from a faculty member who was an early adopter but also um, very engaged with our OER degree initiative. And, you know, it, it is a labor of love with emphasis on the labor. I don't think we can ignore that um, there is a lot of time and effort that goes into adoption, whether it's adoption or creation, and that varies depending on the level of um, uh, of involvement with the faculty, whether they are creating something from the ground up or they are adopting, uh, excuse me, adapting. So it is important to recognize and um, support the faculty in their in their change and, and recognizing that it's for many is a cultural shift. Um, so one of the things that we've done at ACC is through the libraries, we've done a textbook hero campaign. Um, the cape is optional. You'll see a couple of them wearing the red cape for being the textbook hero. But we've been able to um, work with them to highlight the resources that they've adopted, the money that they saved uh, their students, and um, sort of why they teach using open educational resources. The poster that you see with the large group, that is our student development department. So those are some of the faculty um, that have adopted the course uh, in that student development area for the EDUC 1300. And again, that's our department with the largest adoption. So our story isn't over. Um, we have some twists and turns. Uh, we have some challenges that we hope haven't overcome. Um, and I've said this a couple of times throughout, but, you know, we didn't start small. It's Texas, and we went big. And so now that we've gone big, we can't go home. We have to keep going, whatever that might look like. Um, and so we have to recognize uh, what we need to do to sustain that and keep um, the students engaged and keep the faculty engaged and supported. Uh, we had some hiccups with platform changes. I mentioned that Lumen Learning was the platform for the grant. Um, it was an institutional decision after the grant was over in order to keep it at low cost, at zero cost for our students, um, that we would move away from Lumen Learning. So while the courses are still there for others to use, if our faculty wanted to adapt and modify and integrate some things into Blackboard, we had to look for someplace else to host them um, so our faculty could edit them and update them. And so we made the decision to um, to help faculty move things to OER Commons. And so that took a level of involvement of getting our um, instructional web and instructional technology uh, staff involved and liaisoning with OER Commons to make that successful. 
Uh, we are a Blackboard institution, so also helping, helping faculty uh, maybe use Blackboard as an interim platform. So we haven't solved that issue yet, and I don't think it's a one-size-fits-all solution. So depending on what faculty want to do, adapt, adopt, create, um, we may have to have a variety, we're going to have to have a variety of solutions for that, but I don't think we've, we've answered that question fully yet. And again, like I've said several times, um, trying to figure out how we identify these courses um, and, again, the awareness from the student, not just on the cost savings, but some of the other benefits of uh, what these types of courses and types of learning materials can do for them and their success as a student. So actually tomorrow uh, we have a meeting with a handful of people across the institution, um, administrators, faculty, faculty development staff, and, um, and a dean. Uh, we have uh, other instructional initiative staff that are involved, and we're coming together to talk about our sort of compression and sustainability questions and plans. So we need to ask and address and identify a lot of things, including, um, you know, if we are to add additional Z degree pathways, what are the processes for that going to be? Um, we need to identify and think about, prioritize um, some of the institutional needs, the faculty needs, what do they need to be supported for their development, um, and we need to honestly look at some of the cultural shifts in the college, both at an institutional level and a department level. Um, what are some of the barriers that currently exist to either faculty adoption, whether it's at an overarching institutional level or even a departmental level when it comes to choosing course materials. Um, and so now that we've moved beyond sort of the container of this grant, uh, how do we continue to evolve? and address some of these questions. And I've left it as it's a story not yet written um, because we haven't closed the book on this and we are continuing to um, learn more and, and, and seek answers uh, to questions that, that still remain. And I don't think we're going to solve it tomorrow, but tomorrow is a good start um, for this type of, of planning. So I'm going to end there. I think I've ended a few minutes early, so I, I did see some questions pop up in the chat. So. Um, thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any of the questions. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, so we're going to go over to the questions now, and um, my little. So the first question that uh, popped up was from Jason Fellows saying, "One of the questions they've been asked is how." their Barnes & Noble's books or would respond to OER textbooks? Would it violate their contract? Did you have any issues um, partnering with your bookstore? Or did they have concerns? Uh, I, not that I'm aware of. I mean, there may have been some conversations that I wasn't a part of <laughs> that may have raised some concerns, but um, they were to have in these discussions. And uh, I know every institution is different in terms of not only who their bookstore is and the relationship that they have with them, but, um, you know, it helped them understand and be able to answer questions from faculty um, and students. You know, students would go in and not understand what notes meant and just to kind of help mitigate some of the miscommunication about what students needed. I think it's important to work with, with the bookstore. Um, Barnes & Noble also has their own OER product. Um, and from what I understand, it's sort of a bundled package, so there are fees. It's not zero cost, but um, sort of a courseware approach. Um, and in my conversations with the bookstore at ACC, there's been very low adoption of that. I think only one or two faculty are actually using the Barnes & Noble OER branded product. But um, they're also a great solution in terms of if, if a faculty is, for example, using an OpenStax textbook, and they want to provide um, print copies. You know, it's essential to work with the bookstore so that those print copies can be made available for the students to purchase um, purchase that way, too. Great. Uh, the next question comes from Rebecca. Did faculty have release time in order to create or adopt OER for the curriculum? For, for this grant, they did. Um, they had uh, the course developers were given um, some release time and a stipend, and then the course reviewers uh, were given 
a stipend. And the difference between the two were, I mentioned that we went in as a consortium. So ACC agreed to develop a handful of classes or courses and then review a handful of other courses. And so the courses that we were reviewers for were being developed at one of those other three institutions. So it really just depended on um, the role of the faculty, whether they were a reviewer um, or a developer. Great. Another question from Rebecca. Are courses across the different colleges in the consortium using the same OER or the same course? And did they work collaboratively to create or adopt? So um, in theory, uh, collaboration was essential. Um, I think we realized doing a, um, a multi-institution consortium, we all have our own institutional cultures and processes and procedures. So I think, to be honest, maybe there wasn't as much collaboration as we had intended from the beginning. Um, but when we first launched, um, the reviewers were asked to pilot the classes that were developed at another institution for at least one semester. So for at least one semester, faculty at ACC were teaching with the materials developed at those other institutions in the consortium. I have, in some of, some of them I know are still continuing with that. Um, others have modified and adapted it to sense, sense the original creation um, to meet their own needs. So um, there was collaboration. I think if we had to do it again, we would think a little bit more about the structure of how, of how that collaboration should happen. Um, I don't think we were really com prepared to communicate effectively across the institutions from faculty to faculty. Um, the importance of that cross collaboration to really improve the courses. So I think it was, um, you know, we were, because it was a short timeline and so sort of ramping up quickly on that. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions for Carrie before we take our break before Matt DiCarlo presents? Okay, I'm not seeing any other things submitted, but if you have a question for Carrie that you would like her to answer at a later time, you can always submit it to the chat box, and um, if we have time, oh, wait, yes, Jason, um, we will be putting all the PowerPoints up um, in available for access on the Open Education Southern Symposium's IR page. Um, we will also um, make the link available, recording link available afterwards as well. So, uh, for now, we'll take a short break. Um, we'll resume at 1 o'clock for uh, Matt's presentation. And as I was saying, if you have any questions that pop up for carrying your mind, um, feel free to still submit them to the chat box, and I can um, forward them to Carrie or if she's able to answer um, after the presentations later this afternoon as well. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Carrie. Matt, just so you know, I have um, Go ahead and proceed with our second presentation of our three-hour webinar. Our second presenter is Matthew DiCarlo at Radford University, and he is a professor of social work, and he's going to be presenting on his open social work um, education project. 
So, Matt, take it away. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I really love the first presentation, so uh, hopefully that I can do uh, a serviceable job on the second one. Uh, so today, um, I, I wanted to sort of frame this as open scholarship. Uh, so what is open scholarship? <laughs> so open scholarship, uh, as uh, conceptualized uh, in an article from 2012, uh, which I'll link to in my references, sort of involves uh, opening yourself up as a uh, scholar. And I think um, that can be challenging to sort of think about. Um, I think as somebody, this is my third year as a uh, tenure track faculty member. Before that, I was an adjunct for two years while I was getting my uh, grad degree. And, um, I mean, for teaching is pretty open. I mean, you share a lot about yourself. You share a lot about your interests. Um, and I think open scholarship can be sort of challenging to think about because it involves really opening up all of the things that you do uh, to the extent that you want about how you teach things. Um, so for me, that means uh, that the resources that I use inside of the classroom, I share widely. Um, I share with as many people as I can, people who want to use them or adapt them, uh, and I use resources from other people. So building on sort of the informal resource sharing networks that exist inside of social work education and that I'm sure exist inside of your disciplines as well. Um, but uh, open scholarship, they sort of uh, conceptualize as this sort of uh, a, a commitment towards open access and open publishing, uh, uh, working with OER, uh, sharing OER, and trying to create the sort of network of participatory scholarship around how to teach uh, inside of your discipline. Uh, so uh, this sort of quote quote here, um, open scholarship is a phenomenon and practices that surround scholars using digital and network technologies, underpinned by certain grounding assumptions regarding openness and democratization of knowledge, creation, and dissemination. Uh, so the idea behind this is to sort of demystify and democratize access to knowledge uh, and the creation of that knowledge uh, within a given discipline. Uh, and why I think this is sort of important is because OER uh, has come a long way. We have a lot of books. Um, open educational resources, I think, sort of the easiest hook in for a lot of uh, faculty is with textbooks because so many of us use uh, textbooks inside of the space, and there are a lot of books. Um, so this is from the uh, Dabson uh, Soviet Research Group. Again, it's linked inside of the uh, references for this uh, slide show. Um, a lot of people are using OER, um, especially introductory level faculty. Um, so for many of those faculty, they have simply switched uh, to um, most likely the OpenStax books. Um, about 48% of colleges, according to OpenStax, use their books. Uh, over the last five years, according to Spark Open, which is a uh, OER advocacy group uh, and also a study group, um, they've, we've achieved about a billion dollars in student savings. And most of those are coming from sort of your big name OER vendors, OpenStax being uh, one of the biggest ones, Human Learning, LibreText, um, also good examples. Uh, the Open Textbook Library is a little different. They're not really a vendor so much. They're more of a library for OER resources, but there are a lot of textbooks in there as well. Um, so this is a promotional graphic that uh, Lumen uh, threw out there uh, right before Christmas this past year. So you can start to see uh, some of their outcomes, which, I mean, they have 210 institutional partners, they have $20 million in savings, they're reaching hundreds of thousands of students. Um, and I think that is really admirable, but, I mean, we look at OpenStack, but they're reaching so many, so many students. 2.2 million students that they've saved uh, students over a half a billion dollars over the last, you know, seven years. That's a lot of stuff. That doesn't actually impact me in social work education at all. I mean, I'm for open educational resources because I think that they are, uh, they democratize access to knowledge and it helps, uh, you know, students who are from historically underrepresented groups have access to the knowledge they need in order to be successful inside of classes. But you know, not a lot of people are taking social work classes unless you were social work majors. Uh, at Radford University, where I teach, there is, I think, uh, two 200 level classes. There's no 100 level class. Even your intro to social work uh, courses, you don't really take those classes that's not a social work major. Um, so instead, uh, we're, we're really in sort of a space where Room and learning, open science, they're not really going to touch us. Uh, they're not really going to create OERs for us because they're focusing on the most bang for the buck. And that's not, that's not a disparaging thing at all. 
uh, I think that's where they should go. Um, so their funders, uh, people like the Hewlett Foundation, the uh, Gates Foundation, they're really interested in making the most financial impact for students that they possibly can. Um, but that means for me, for upper-level undergraduate and graduate-level courses, we don't have a lot to work with. Uh, I can tell you a little story about uh, what it was like. Uh, so I got introduced to OER uh, from a uh, resource librarian uh, who came and cold called our department and presented at a faculty meeting. And at the end of that meeting, um, everybody sort of got around the table and was like, this is a really great idea. OER is really great. Too bad there's nothing in the social work. There were no textbooks. There were some resources on OER Commons that were low, but there wasn't really like a way to sort of sift through those things. Uh, there were concerns about quality of those things. Uh, and so uh, while I think that served as a pretty big barrier, and justifiably so for a lot of my colleagues, um, I sort of took out of the invitation. Um, I had been wanting to redesign my uh, social work research methods class for a little while. Uh, so uh, luckily, one of the uh, kinds of textbooks that was out there was a research methods textbook. Uh, there were a ton of them inside of the Open Textbook uh, Library, uh, so I ended up adapting one of them for uh, social work, and uh, as a result of that process, I really think uh, I started a project called Open Social Work Education, uh, which is focused on uh, sort of these five core areas, uh, creating textbooks and sharing textbooks, uh, conducting research on OER within our discipline, uh, Helping facilitate some of the resource sharing, I think OER is a really great way to sort of scale up what we already do to share resources, usually informally within a department, at uh, conference presentations of uh, different educators within a discipline, and also to provide education and training to faculty and, and conduct advocacy. Uh, because uh, from a social work perspective, OER are a social justice-focused intervention. So as somebody who's acting inside of the higher education discipline, I really see OER as a way to conduct some policy shift. So uh, let's start with sort of the first uh, and probably the thing I've done the most with, uh, which is our textbooks initiative. So uh, the first thing that I do, uh, and you can see this on opensocialworkeducation.com, is link to existing textbooks. Like I mentioned before, there's a bunch of research methods textbooks. Um, the one that I adapted is, um, so the, the textbook that I adapted is uh, the first uh, open textbook for social work. But there are some sociology textbooks, uh, like the one that I adapted, that would be relevant. You would need to sort of uh, change them and, 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 and put in some other content. Uh, so uh, a colleague of mine at George, uh, uh, James Madison University, uh, which is also in Virginia, she uses the social problem sociology textbook in there, um, but it's sort of from a different frame of reference. So you have to put a lot more strength-based stuff if you're going to uh, teach it inside of the social work class. Uh, so my goal is to sort of, with this, uh, try and link to a, a bunch of different textbooks so that social work faculty, when they are thinking about, okay, I want to redesign my class, I'm thinking about OER, what's out there? What can I start working with? Where can I start from? That they have a place where they can go. That's sort of a single clearing house for textbooks. Uh, but like I mentioned, there's just not a lot out there. Um, the way that uh, social work education is sort of broken out and it's been the same way for decades, we have a lot more ability to play with it now uh, than we used to. As long as we're teaching the same stuff, we can sort of put it in whatever box, uh, whatever courses we want. But most institutions still use the sort of traditional focus of research, policy, theory, and practice. You get two courses of each, and then there's some electives and introductory work and other things that uh, departments do as well. So um, my goals for the Open by 2025 projects are to create um, open textbooks for each of these core domains. Uh, so we're going to have a DSW and an MSW research methods textbook, same thing for policy, same thing for social work theory, and same thing for practice. Uh, so as a research methods instructor, um, I'm excited to say that our research methods stuff is kind of almost done, or, or will be almost done basically by the end of 2019. Uh, we have the DSW textbook, which you can see here in this graphic. Um, we also have, uh, I'm happy to announce, we were just funded through the uh, VIVA, um, which is the Virginia Library Consortium's uh, first ever uh, open education grant, uh, course redesign grant. So we are working with, uh, at Radford University, we're working with Virginia Commonwealth University School of Social Work and Monmouth University School of Social Work to uh, redesign our classes and create a uh, graduate-level research methods textbook. 
that will be peer reviewed uh, and will also be reviewed by students as well. Uh, and that should become available in August. So at that point, we'll have the research part pretty much done. Uh, I think I'm going to give you a little bit of a peek behind the curtain for how these things have gone. I've gotten a lot of people who are interested in policy, but I think the challenge is, um, and I know that you guys have this at the uh, University of Arkansas, and it really depends on the state and the institution. Course redesign is really resource intensive. It's very time intensive for faculty. So while people might have some interest, uh, they may need to wait until they have funding for a sabbatical or until a grant program might afford them the opportunity or the resources to actually do that uh, resource creation. Uh, so policy is something where people have expressed a lot of interest, but I don't see it moving in the next year or two, uh, at least as fast as I would like. Um, so theory, not a lot of people on board with that yet. We did have a theory instructor um, who approached us, somebody who, who had written a traditional textbook, uh, that he had gotten the rights uh, reverted from. Uh, so he, the publisher basically said, we're not really doing much with this. Uh, if you want uh, this back, you can have it. Um, and so he uh, shared that stuff on the low, um, and he was uh, sort of thinking about releasing it as a, like, legit open textbook. And I think we ran into some uh, issues with that uh, with the rights reversion. So um, this is something that I'm not super familiar with as somebody who's not a copyright librarian or a copyright scholar. Um, but what we got to was the publisher, although it allowed him to do some things with the material uh, after the publisher stopped really selling or promoting it, it didn't allow him to do all of the things that we would so republishing that existing textbook would be not okay given the agreement. Uh, so if you guys are considering uh, how to build out OER inside of your discipline, one of the places that you might target are people who have written textbooks that were great, but there just aren't, that never caught on for some reason, or that publishers just are sitting on and not really doing much with. Um, but some of the challenges that you might come across are that the rights version may not have the language that you need in order to re-release that as OER. Uh, but one of the more encouraging areas is in uh, social work practice. Uh, we have uh, two authors who uh, put out a uh, interview textbook as OAER. Um, so they created a very low cost, so a $10 book that you can buy via Amazon. Uh, create space, and they're using a lot of, uh, they're using the funds to get through that for some really great things, like student travel funds and things like that. So, um, although it is technically a for-profit book, uh, and it does not have a Creative Commons license on it, so it wouldn't really be technically OER, uh, they are interested in sort of converting into full OER, and, and they can sort of continue that program. And I think that's another sort of interesting point with this, is that if you are the original author of the OER, you don't, you're not uh, bound to never make any money from it. Um, that you can release stuff as OER so people can uh, view it online for free, but so many students prefer print, and you can then charge them for print. It's not really a good way to make a business, but it is a good way to either get some remuneration for your work or to provide things like these authors are doing, like some cool student grant programs. Um, so the the overall framework on this is to try and find people who are either already working in it, who have interest in this stuff, and try and create some working groups. So our research working group is really the most robust at this point. Um, like I mentioned, we have some senior faculty. Um, I'm working with a lot of people from my PhD cohort, uh, and uh, we also recruited some students. I think those have been really good working groups so far uh, for our MSW textbook. And uh, I think it's important to note that uh, faculty, one of the sort of barriers to getting faculty to get on board with open textbooks is that a lot of them don't come with ancillary resources. So you don't get everything you would with a regular publisher, and we're sort of trying to meet that need by putting out a resource package. Uh, so you're going to get slideshows, you're going to get quiz banks. They may not integrate directly with your, uh, you know, uh, LMS platform, but you will actually have things where you can use them uh, you can use quizzes, you can use activities, uh, so that it's a little bit easier to just pick up and go with an open textbook. Uh, one of the great things about OER is that you don't just have to work with faculty. Uh, so um, inside of some of my classes, I'm integrating uh, open pedagogy. Um, open pedagogy is a really great area to sort of think about uh, if you get involved in. Uh, the sort of broad strokes idea of it is that most of the scholarship uh, that is done at universities right now is thrown in the trash, uh, and its intended audience is an audience of one, and that is your instructor. 
And that may not be the best way, that there may be a lot of waste uh, as far as fellowship goes. So uh, some of the things that we're doing now inside of uh, my classes, uh, I have released, um, so we've created exemplars for some of the assignments that uh, I released as part of my course package for my research methods textbook. I've then uh, sort of used students' examples so they can literally follow somebody from their original research question, their literature on the topic, all the way through creating a proposal and analyzing the data. Uh, so they can sort of follow along with how other students have done it. Uh, and students have really found that to be valuable. Um, some of the things I'm looking forward to doing are actually creating books with students. Uh, so this summer we're going to, uh, I teach a uh, series of substance abuse uh, electives. And so rather than students having to write term papers at the end, instead they're going to write book chapters. Obviously, the first round of these is not going to lead to a perfect textbook. Uh, so me, as the instructor, I'm going to end up being an editor. Um, there are some great resources out there from the Rebus community on how to uh, create resources with uh, other faculty and also how to create resources with students. Um, but the goal is over uh, at least a couple of years of teaching this, we can actually create a textbook, uh, one that isn't out there already and that meets uh, what students actually need inside of that class. So I mentioned research. Um, so uh, while there is good research in general on OER, um, again, most of it is going to be confined to those like high enrollment general education classes. So um, if I'm going to do research on OER inside of social work education, it's going to address a somewhat new population, or at least an underexplored population. So upper level undergraduates uh, is the first focus here. So we did a uh, really quick AD study uh, comparing our traditional textbook, which was $150 on research methods, to um, open textbook um, for students. So our quantitative results uh, were, let's say, not great. Um, we had some compounds um, right before our post-test measures uh, for the uh, social work research knowledge assessment, which is that first um, that first bar right up here. Um, there was a major snowstorm, so a lot of these students ended up having to take it while snowed into their house after an emergency. So their scores weren't so great. Um, I also found that there are significant changes in evaluation scores, but the directionality of those things is unclear. Uh, and along with uh, other literature inside of OER, final grades, there was a negligible impact. Um, so with standard measures of significance, there isn't really any significant impact. I think the only thing that really went up that was of note is that students' self-efficacy after the class uh, increased in applying research knowledge. Um, but some of the qualitative results really sing a little bit more loudly. Uh, so what we did is this is a student-engaged uh, research project. So we had a uh, graduate student or an undergraduate student lead focus groups on textbook costs with students directly. Uh, and uh, so we had students who were reflecting on cost um, inside of our control group. Uh, they talked about it was so expensive. This was the most expensive book that I've had. Um, and the only reason that they bought it is because I had quizzes each week. So I basically required them to buy it. I was the person who actually used that stuff. Uh, and that sort of jives with some of the data that we're getting in a different study, which is basically students have been burned so many times by professors who required textbooks that they never used or very rarely used. And for a student, like, that's $150, 200 That's like a, a, at least a couple weeks of groceries. Um, and in our control conditions and our pilot conditions, um, we really found that students were quite happy with the fact they didn't have to pay for another book. Um, that... Uh, since the OER textbook it is open and freely available, you can uh, read it while you're at your doctor's office. You can, uh, you know, if you're, if you're out with your kid doing something, you can pick up and do your reading wherever it is. You don't have to log into a publisher's platform. It's just a website that exists or a PDF document that you download to your phone. Uh, I think this is really important for faculty who are considering adaptation. Uh, they really found that, like, a customized textbook was really important. Uh, so I often felt like my job as a faculty member teaching research methods was translating the textbook. But the textbook was written for a broad audience and in very abstract language. Uh, so part of the adaptation process for me was really looking at, like, what can I do to, to make that better? Um, so, and I think that really succeeded with some of that stuff. What they talked about is that, you know, there's no ignore this chapter. Everything is in the exact order that we, that we uh, sort of expected it to be. We followed the, the book straight on through. That the language was easy to understand. Uh, so the book I adapted very fortunately used very approachable informal language with lots of contractions, lots of examples. Uh, and I think they also said that they just felt like there was less distance between the author and the student 
because I was talking about examples from my practice. I was talking about research studies that I've done. I was talking about my wife, who some of these people know as a field instructor, and what her practice is like, and what sort of research she does with the programs that she runs in our area. So um, it's, I think that's an important sort of message, is that for faculty who maybe want to work in OER, the benefits to students are pretty, are pretty good. Um, and students also, I, I label this as engaging. I think a better and more accurate phrasing is that it's not it's less boring uh, because the language, there's a uh, more approachable language, and uh, it was written in a more conversational style. Uh, I think in sort of moving forward, some of the things that we saw out of this uh, study was that students didn't quite understand. They don't read their emails at the beginning of class, so when it spelled out, this is where you can get the textbook, and here's the link, and here's the PDF, and that stuff, they didn't get that. Uh, so we had a lot of students who just bought uh, the paper copy from the bookstore uh, rather than accessing it for free when they would have otherwise gotten the thing for free. Uh, and we are sending this to uh, our NSW students, so we're comparing the same textbook and introductory research methods textbook, uh, doing the same sort of A-B study, but at two different sites. So we have a traditional full-time NSW program. We also have a hybrid online uh, part-time program. Uh, so our part-time program, disproportionately, these are older students. Students are coming back to school after a little while of practice, and also students who are all working full-time and who are all more engaged with the online section of learning just because they're in a hybrid online program. So we're trying to see whether OER uh, impacts those studies or impacts those populations differently. Uh, and uh, we hope to scale these up uh, in we're thinking about these as sort of pilot studies and trying to scale these up to more national studies, comparing uh, faculty who might implement this textbook and their uh, original textbook across a lot of different campuses across this country. Uh, our last project uh, piece that we're working on now is a uh, study of textbook costs. So there are a lot of um, textbook cost studies out there. Uh, the Florida, uh, Florida Virtual Campus Study. Um, there was even a study by Stengage uh, a little while ago about how uh, much students spend and what, what those impacts are. And uh, we wanted to sort of figure out, okay, well, that's sort of the general knowledge about higher education. What does that mean for social work education? So social work is a discipline that should be oriented towards social justice and, and uh, specific and uh, uh, historically discriminates against and oppressed populations. Do those people face textbook costs at a higher degree? How does that affect their academic performance and their opinions about higher education? Uh, and I think that will sort of help with OER advocacy and OER outreach because it sort of builds the case for OER. You think about sort of policy advocacy from the perspective of a policy change, that would be OER, but you also need to figure out that there, or you need to make the case that there's a social problem here, that we're trying to address something. And the biggest one you can think you're hooking to is textbook costs just because textbooks are so expensive. For those of you guys who are interested in research, I very, very much uh, recommend the OER Research Fellowship. Uh, it is done by the Open Education Group, and uh, their mission is basically to uh, expand out the empirical literature on OER, um, but it's to also bring it outside of sort of the, uh, the journals that mostly publish on OER or higher education in general and into specific disciplines. So, uh, from this uh, sort of fellowship and community of practice around researching OER, uh, I'm going to try and publish as much as I can on OER inside of social work education. Um, so, yeah, I think, and uh, they'll also pay open access fees for your uh, articles, which is kind of nice. Uh, I think the, the sort of thing with OER is that it is also connected between uh, the different opens, so uh, open educational resources, open access, and also open science. Uh, so moving into the resources section, um, uh, one of the things that uh, I'm really excited about doing is uh, taking that textbook cost study and then sharing our data as public, anonymizing it as much as we can, and then putting that out there to the public. Uh, and that is an example of using open science. So there are the people who play in the data and verify what we found, but also we can then use that stuff as OER. So I'm a research methods instructor. I have an open data set that I can include inside of research methods textbooks. I can then share those exercises with faculty members. So say, for instance, you're trying to teach people how to do t-tests. So I have this data set that you can see uh, that's already out there. And it's on a topic that students probably care a lot about, that they're experiencing right then. So I can you can sort of use that to build uh, exercises inside of classes. As I mentioned before, um, we also are building uh, course packages for uh, textbooks. 
Uh, so for um, all of the textbooks that we are creating, um, we are putting out a sort of comprehensive course package. And I think the idea is to be sort of the same as a traditional publisher on first draft. But after people adopt it, to then go out and ask them, hey, do you have other stuff that you would add to the course package? Do you have slideshows that you would use that are better or different? Are there activities that you use? Let's put them all together so that the next time you release this, we have a community approach towards how do you teach this stuff. Um, I think that's really exciting. Uh, and sort of the uh, overall goal or the sort of reach goal for this is to try and create um, a website and a one-stop repository for course preparation. So the way that I was taught to do course preparation, like when I started teaching, uh, was to go to the people who had taught it before. And the culture I was raised in uh, was that person shares with you everything that they do. That they share their slideshows, activities, their prompts, course calendars, the whole syllabus. And then you, as a scientist not required by the department, get to choose what you want to use, what you don't want to use, what you want to customize, and all that stuff. Uh, and I want to create a place where uh, faculty can go to find those things. So uh, to sort of build the network uh, in which uh, faculty would sort of uh, do that research on course prep. So uh, let's say, for example, you are teaching a uh, uh, class on social welfare policy. If you don't want to use a textbook, maybe I can look at other people's course calendars and, like, what journal articles they use, what websites they use, what uh, videos they use to teach specific concepts, and then build from there. So that's what OER, I think, allows you to do, um, is to sort of take the stuff that we already kind of do in an informal sense and really scale it up uh, with the proper legal permissions and uh, trying to sustain a culture that really works with uh, the commons. And I think that's a challenge, especially inside of a discipline like me, uh, or like mine, uh, in social work where there's just not a lot of knowledge uh, about open educational resources. That is hopefully changing. Uh, so some of the things that we're hoping to do is add social work education conferences. Uh, there's one big one, and then there are about three or four, four small ones inside of the U.S. every year. It's going to have some informal gatherings. Just uh, one of the biggest barriers uh, in, um, in that Batson study for uh, OER adoption and OER creation is that people just don't know other people who are working in the open. And so uh, one of the goals of uh, the Open Social Work Education Project is to try and connect those people so that you can have share where people uh, just share their resources. To have test bank sprints where somebody might come up uh, for a specific textbook, you might gather 10, 15 people to write test questions for that stuff as part of a social event. Uh, to table as a vendor or an exhibitor at those things, uh, to sort of share uh, open textbooks that exist and also get people to share their stuff if they're willing to do that. And give them a little bit of training on what OER is. It's not particularly hard to get started, especially like for resource sharing specifically, chances are these faculty have a video or an activity or a case study or something that they would be willing to share with other people that other people would benefit from. The, the goal is to sort of create these like low, um, these not very taxing ways of getting started on resource sharing. Uh, and that sort of like dovetails into the education piece. Uh, so I'm doing uh, presentations and training, so I'm doing some targeted outreach to schools of social work. Uh, so I've done a roadshow road presentation, um, which has literally been a roadshow. They haven't been webinars. It's been me in person going and talking with uh, schools of social work inside of Virginia about open education. And for most of them, it is the first time that somebody is approaching them. That's not everywhere. Um, but for most of them, it's the first they may have heard of OER in passing. Um, but the goal is to sort of focus on OER as a social justice issue and bring those people on board conceptually to try and build collaborations across the state. Um, I mentioned before that um, my team was a recipient of the DIVA grant, the course redesign grant. Um, so one of their main uh, things is to try and get people across the state to collaborate on stuff that are going to change entire courses across the state. So, um, for example, the research methods class or introductory to, introduction to social work class is taught like at least three times at different institutions uh, across the state. Wouldn't it be great if at least like five or six instructors got together and then figured out a way to turn that course open and to eliminate costs for students and to sort of build a community of practice around how to teach that stuff. Uh, that's what I hope to do with this uh, and also sort of signal there's some other OER work of other people 
Um, we have some other open textbook authors that obviously will feature on the website, but I would, like, really love to, like, grant to other people and say, like, look, other people are doing this, and you can adopt these things in addition to the stuff that, like, uh, people who are uh, inside of our project are working on as well. Uh, so I've also done trainings at my schools, um, and I think as we're sort of thinking about different audiences, one of the ones that I am hoping to get into is, and that we've sort of used for data collection, setting up some of these trainings, uh, is DSLEC. Uh, so they are the, it's the Virginia Social Work Education Consortium. Uh, so to try and target uh, organizations like that, uh, which are filled with the administrators of social work education programs, and then target them for uh, education and um, to try and do some training with them. Uh, and uh, hopefully I'm going to be branching out as well uh, to a more national audience. And uh, I think as I'm sort of thinking about that stuff, I'm going to try and find places that have uh, OER grant programs. Because uh, really, if we're talking about resource creation, and that's really what we're doing in social work, because there's just not a lot out there yet, um, having that support for at least a semester or something where faculty can have uh, the time they need to actually create stuff is really important. All right, last piece, advocacy. So um, my advocacy piece is probably actually the most anemic out of all of these, um, but I'm really excited to say that it's actually starting to uh, sort of come together. Um, so inside of Virginia, we were mandated by the legislature uh, last year to come up with, at all public institutions of higher education, some kind of plan to address textbook costs, and that plan had to uh, sort of uh, use OER or low-cost traditional resources. And so in talking with a lot of the other uh, campus leaders, uh, the Open Textbook Network campus leaders in the state, the implementation at different schools is really varied. Um, the legislature also just added in our most recent session that uh, we are going to be demanded, we're going to be labeling courses as OER if they use them. That was going to be a mandatory part of these policies now. Um, but at Radford, we're sort of very grateful, or I'm very grateful, and our, and our, our committee is very grateful, uh, that our provost basically uh, sort of convened people from different schools. Uh, we then brought our um, faculty development people on board, um, our IT people, we'll also bring the bookstore in, to try and uh, sort of come up with what's going to work for us on the campus. If our goal is to try and create political change and to try and advocate for the use of OER, what can we do? Um, so we can hold trainings, we can try and build community, we can signal boost the work of others. Like one of the great things about uh, working on this committee has been uh, being able to reach out to other people on our campus who are working with EDN. There are other uh, grant winners on the state level who are doing really great stuff. And uh, part of our job is just to try and uh, help each other with the, with the projects that we're on as much as we can and to uh, just let other people know that on our campus that other people are working on this stuff. And um, I think what I'm hoping to do next is do a more systematic study of the uh, advocacy process inside of Virginia and sort of see what policies and institutions came up with and how that other uh, processes sort of differ from campus to campus. I think that'll be really great. Um, our goal is to get towards on our campus informal support for OER research or OER redesign because we don't have money out there uh, for that stuff, and that's going to be a, a, a sort of thing. That's going to be sort of a reach goal for us is to try and get uh, either presidential fellows or other types of state money that might be uh, that faculty can use in order to uh, engage in course redesign. Oh man, that was much shorter than I thought it was going to be. So here are some takeaways. Um, so open is about more than just free stuff. Um, it's actually about sharing and conducting research and really trying to achieve social change inside of higher education. There's a reason why, if you sort of start playing around the OER space, a lot of them talk about issues of diversity, access, and equity inside of higher education. Because that's what OER ultimately tries to address. And uh, in sort of a more uh, pedagogical sense, that's what it tries to address in the classroom as well, not just in higher education overall. But it's about sharing resources with um, other faculty members. It's about trying to create social change inside of the classroom by sort of between the level or at least address the power imbalance between the professor and their students. So try and get students as co-creators of knowledge, uh, students who are going to create things that they have more buy-in for because they know that their work is going to be read by other people. It's going to be useful 
to somebody else, not just something that they do that they're professionally doing for, and then throws in the trash. Um, so I, my advice to you guys is to just pick any OER project. Uh, I've picked a lot of them. Um, this has been sort of a smorgasbord of different things that um, I'm trying with this project, and I, you don't, please don't be overwhelmed by that stuff. You can pick any one of these things. Uh, and I, 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 I really think that if you start one, you'll probably want to start another because everybody who works in OER and everybody that knows like the nicest person and is also incredibly helpful. These are people who want to share their resources with you. They want to share their research with you and they want to work with you on stuff to the extent that they can because there's a lot of work that's left to do inside of OER. We've done a good job uh, in general of addressing issues of textbook cost and access uh, in high enrollment classes. But where we're going to have to go next, that sort of next wave of stuff is going to be around uh, upper level undergraduate classes. It's going to be about graduate classes and more specialized areas. Uh, there are lots of people inside of the OER research, program, uh, research fellows program that are working on that stuff inside of their discipline. We have a soil scientist. We have somebody who works in applied behavioral analysis for people with autism. There's a lot of, like, really specialized disciplines, and that's where this stuff hopefully is going to go. Yeah, all right. That was, that was a little shorter than I expected, but uh, this is me. Please uh, contact me if you guys have any questions on this stuff, if you know somebody who might uh, want to uh, learn more about this project. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, so we have a couple of questions already in the chat box, so if you have any other questions for Matt. Just submit them to the chat box, and I'll read them out. So our first one comes from Jason. The print copies the students may buy in the bookstore, do the bookstores charge very much for it, or is it just the cost of printing? So um, the textbook that I adapted is a non-commercial license. Um, and I think it's important to note that, like, that doesn't prevent people from making money off of it. It just means that I can't. So uh, the bookstore can make a little profit off of it, um, the uh, person who's printing it, they don't have to do it out of the kindness of their heart. They can charge money for it. Um, but uh, so the, the print copies do actually cost money. Um, when I approached the Barnes & Noble bookstore about this stuff, uh, like I mentioned in the chat a little earlier, they were super on board with it. Um, but they asked that I go with their preferred vendor, vendor which was Xanadu. Uh, so Dan, S-A-N-E-D-U. Um, so the reason why they asked me to go with uh, Xanadu was that um, Xanadu would buy back old editions, and they sort of build that into the price for students. So I think that the book um, probably should have been $30, it ended up being like $37 or $38, because it had that sort of buyback thing in there. Um, and I was overall pretty satisfied with their work. Um, I ended up going with a different vendor just for weird time reasons this past semester. Uh, and that uh, print edition, which I got, which was a cover uh, that was in color, uh, but the rest of it was just black and white. Uh, that was that is thirty dollars for students, including shipping. Uh, and I went with printneedone.com because uh, they have a specific portal for OER. Um, so mostly they are like low cost. I think thirty dollars is probably the best thing for that. Um, I think a lot of our students also will just print out the chapter that they're reading that week and then create a binder of that thing uh, because they have the, uh, the they have the ability to do that. Um, so one of the unique things about our satellite campus is that uh, they actually have access to a free multifunction printer um, with sort of an informal understanding they may not have used that. Uh, so a lot of times our students will just print out the next week's chapters when they're there on campus and then they read that for that week. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Um, yeah. Next question is from Terry. Have you found faculty to be more receptive to adoption when they hear about it from another faculty member in the discipline already doing it versus attending a general session or presentation or a mix of faculty across disciplines presented by someone not in their field? That's a really good question. Um, I, I say, oh, man, the best answer is I don't know. Um, because I, I, so I mean, as a trainer, um, I actually, I, I'm going to start work as an, OER, as an Open Textbook Network campus trainer, so I'll be doing some more of those, like, general uh, presentations. Um, I think that, um, so, but the only presentations I've really done have been 
me and then uh, maybe an o- another like general OER person in the room talking to social work faculty about like the about adopting and creating open educational resources. Um, I think it really depends on the faculty's like motivation for redesign. Um, so whether they're like messages like me and don't have any like support or um, like uh, financial support or resource support for creating open educational resources, that's going to be a challenge. Uh, but you'll find some people who are like really buy into the concept. Um, but I think others are really just looking more for like what can I use that's already out there. I'm not interested in becoming an author. I'm not interested in, in adapting or customizing. I'm really just interested like what are the best books out there, and then I'll build stuff for my class uh, specifically. Um, so I think that it's been helpful. Um, I know that the roadshow that I'm doing is sort of an experiment. Um, well, it's not like a full bunch of experiments, but uh, so the uh, it was uh, sponsored by the Virginia Libraries, and they wanted to really see whether um, these more targeted outreach programs using some faculty who are working in this stuff were more effective or led to some more change. I don't know that I have the data to say either way on that, though. Thank you. Any other questions for Matt? We still have a few minutes um, before we take our break. Go ahead and submit them to the chat box, and we'll see. Maybe. I don't get to see if anybody is typing. Um, okay. Well, if there's no more questions um, right now, um, we'll go ahead and take our break before our last presentation of the day at 2 uh, with the link written from the University of Arkansas here as she provides some practical tips for uh, collaborating with different partners on campus and programs here. But thank you, Matt, for a great presentation. You're very welcome. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. And as I said, we'll get our presentation or break now, but if you have any questions, feel free to submit them to the box, and we'll resume at 2 o'clock. Okay, we're back for our last presentation of the day. It's Elaine Thornton from the University of Arkansas, who, where she's the Open Education and Distance Learning Librarian. She's going to be presenting on practical tips for building campus partnerships and planning programs for OER advocacy. So I will be turning it over to her now. Thank you, Stephanie. So, as she said, my topic is, my presentation is titled, Practical Tips, Building Campus Partnerships, and Planning Programs for OER Advocacy. So, I'll start with a little background. Here at the University of Arkansas, we launched our OER course conversion program during the 2016-2017 school year. Um, the program is funded by the university libraries and the global campus. We initially found that there was little awareness on our campus regarding OER, so everything, so even though we had a funded program, we realized that we really needed to step back and focus on some awareness outreach. We talked to faculty one-on-one -on -one and realized that we needed to come up with a more concerted effort to spread the word on OER and get our community up to speed. So this pro presentation is kind of um, a little uh, information about how we're progressing in these efforts. And it's the basis of this talk today. When Stephanie first asked me to speak on this topic, the first thing I thought was, okay, this should be interesting. Why did I think this? Because I really can't say that in the beginning I had a plan or a strategy for building partnerships or planning programs. There was no clear open road with a marked starting line or clear path. Your road might look like this, and I hope it does, but we don't always have the benefit of being able to clearly see the road ahead with all its bends and twists and turns. Sometimes we don't even start with the road. My partnering strategy or plan probably sort of looks more like this, not a road at all. I had one big goal in the middle and a whole bunch of stuff around it. 
I didn't know what all these those things were beyond the big picture of, ta of the task of advocating for OER at the University of Arkansas, raising awareness among our faculty, and providing support to help those who bought into um, into OER meet their goals. I didn't know how to make this stuff happen, but I knew that something was going to happen. We just had to figure out a path, and it was going to happen. This is just to say, don't worry if you don't have a straight path or a plan. Just start collecting your thoughts, engaging in some actions, and move forward. Eventually, it all began to come together for us, organically and somewhat unconsciously sometimes, and then more intentionally after my participation in the Spark and Open Education Leadership Program pilot cohort began. That program was instrumental in helping me focus and acquire the basic knowledge I needed. It also gave me the opportunity to plan focused actions and to get feedback and guidance. Fast forward to the present, preparing for this presentation has been a profitable exercise that has allowed me the opportunity to think back to where we started, what we've done, and then to think about where we still want to go. So today, I offer you a few tips. You don't have to think of them as a linear progression, but think of them more in terms of here's a stockpile of ideas and actions that might work on my campus. Choose a few and implement them. So first we'll start with finding the teaching faculty. If you are faculty, go to campus faculty events and gatherings. If you liaise to departments, be sure to get to know the faculty in your departments. Begin to identify targets based on informal conversations, exploring course schedules on your campus, having conversations with students, and really by any means you can. If you're a librarian, connect with the instructional designers on your campus who have regular contact with individual faculty members. The opposite is recommended for instructional designers. If you're faculty, connect with your campus librarians. And we'll talk more about these connections in a moment. But the point is, everyone knows someone and may be able to point you in the direction of faculty who might be open to considering implementing OER in their courses. The value of getting to know a few members of the teaching faculty, even casually, is that you can listen to their interests and find connections, perhaps even identify people who are already creating their own materials as well as those who are already sympathetic to the cause and interested in helping to ease their students' financial burden, innovate their teaching, and explore different ways of offering their course content to students. So after you've done that, you might want to start thinking about prospective partners. Find out what their goals are and who they're trying to reach. Find a way to mesh your OER goals with theirs. You've met and talked to some faculty, you've planted the seed, but what's next? Find some prospective partners on campus. You should look for other units that work directly with the faculty, that are involved with student success, that are involved with teaching and learning. We need to understand that our best bet for success with OER advocacy is to make, a camp make it a campus-wide priority, a campus-wide program. Interest in OER may have started in the library, we might be the first advocates, but we've got to find and build support in other sectors on campus. If you're going to spread your message about the faculty, to the faculty, the programs that already reach out to them provide great partners. For example, I spent a lot of my first year here, um, I arrived in January 2016, um, at attending teaching and faculty support center programs so that I could not only meet other faculty, but also to get a feel for the type of programming they offered. I eventually approached one of the co-chairs of the center and pitched a session on OER. He was interested and took it to the governing board, and an opportunity was born. From one opportunity, other opportunities may be born. Our campus program began in the library, was solidified through a partnership with the Global Campus, which is our online learning unit. That partnership is solid and productive and continues to expand. After partnering with the TSSE, the Teaching and Faculty Support Center, we looked for other units to partner with for events and programming that would reach the faculty. We've recently partnered with University IT and the Teaching and Innovation Pedagogical Support Center, known as the TIP Center, 
partnering with other units has also gotten us access to their faculty email listservs and access to more avenues for the promotion of our joint events. We hope to work more with partnering with individual college departments and to partner with the Student Success Center on some specific programming and projects in the future. And let me throw in a little side note about students right here. I highly recommend reaching out to the student government on your campus and other student groups as well. After all, this movement is all about the students and trying to secure more affordability for them as they advance through their studies. If you want to gain interest from a diverse student body, you can't just stop with the student government. Technically, they represent the whole student body, but we all know that not all students are connected active or have a real voice in the student government. You want student government on your side, of course, but understand and acknowledge that they are not the only student voices on campus. Our connection with Arkansas Associated Student Government, known as the ASG, has been strengthened this year. They ran our campus's first ever student initiated and run textbook growth event this January. These stories and data they collected have been very useful for our press releases and other um, conversations that we have with faculty about OER. Also, for the second year in a row, one of the presidential candidates for next year's ASD leadership has made OER expansion and advocacy a campaign plank. I've loved working with the members of the ASD over the past year, past three years. I want students from all sectors to get involved and interested in OER. One of the things I was able to do this year was to speak to some incoming graduate students who are participants in the RISE program. This is a diversity-focused initiative for incoming graduate students. I invite one of these students to join our campus advisory group. This is an area of outreach to more and diverse student groups that remains a sticky note on our board and will continue to work on this. So this is all just to say, you know, find your partners, make sure you make connections with the students, and make sure that your partnerships are, are diverse on campus. Next, we'll go into talking about planning your program, planning and delivering your program. Let's shift to talking about programming. One of the first things I'd suggest that you do is to recruit help. On our campus, we have a solid OER team made up of library people and instructional designers. We call it our core team. This is no way, there is no way that we would have made as much progress as we've made on our campus without the broad collaboration of all of these individuals, all of whom are dedicated to OER advocacy, even though they all have other job assignments. If you can find a good, knowledgeable team to work with you, you can call on them to assist with presentation planning and delivery. This also provides a variety of contexts for the campus. This group might be librarians, especially subject liaisons, instructional designers, interested staff, and really anyone who's interested and willing to learn about OER, copyright basics, and textbook affordability, and share that knowledge with the campus community. A little bit about presentation. So we've created a generic kind of program outline for when we do more formal presentations. Presentations themselves need to be tailored to each audience. If you know this is all pretty new on your campus, keep it simple. If you have established an established program with good buy-in and are seeking to advance established initiatives, then you can step up the program. So on the screen right now is an example of a program outline I created for the series of our four faculty development luncheons. We presented via our partnership with the Teaching and Faculty Support Center. The outline considers that, to the best of our knowledge, this is an audience that has little exposure, has had little exposure to the concepts of open education or open educational resources. We started with a broad outline. Uh, we eventually cut out Section 4 on open pedagogy, design, deciding that um, because of time limitations and because of the uh, introductory knowledge that we were trying to provide our audience that we would save that for another presentation later on as we um, advanced our programs here on campus. 
we also created, created a slide deck for the presentation that we now use and remix for any subsequent presentation. Because we have a great knowledgeable team and a basic presentation and basic presentation content, we can plug and play for any presentation that comes up. If one of us can't make it, the others all know the content and can hop in to the presentation where needed. You may also want to think less formally about programs and events. Um, for Open Education Week this week, a couple of days ago, we hosted our first ever OER Mingle, and we did that in conjunction with the TIP Center. And it was more of a casual event where faculty could drop by, have some snacks, and talk about OER. So it doesn't always have to be a formal presentation that you use to get your word out. It, you can also host casual, more casual types of events. Next thing is always remember that you need to follow up. So as part of our presentation, we um, try to um, hand out information sheets and get the faculty to fill them out. This is really simple. We pass out an information contact form to attendees who come to our programs or um, as in the case of a more casual program, um, always have a sign-in sheet. We encourage them to complete the form. You want these so that you will know who you talk to, who is interested, and even who is not, and what your audience already knows about OER. Make sure they understand that completing the form is not going to give them more unwanted email. It's merely for statistical purposes. For those who are librarians, you know we always need to track our contact episodes. Not everyone will fill out a form, but many will. When I reviewed the forms after our four sessions with the faculty at the uh, TFSC luncheons, we were able to send out close to 100 follow-up emails. These were all people who requested more information. Um, as you can see on the form, it asks, you know, um, how familiar they are with OER, how likely they would consider assigning an OER, and if they would like to explore more, um, and on uh, question seven where it said, would you like to schedule a consultation? Yes or maybe, got them an email. They checked no, they did not get an email, which is perfectly fine. So the email included links to our OER guides, um, information um, about OER, and a link to our one-on-one -on -one consultation form, and other basic information that we had mentioned in the presentation. This gives faculty a way to get in touch with us immediately or immediately after the presentation or later. It also gives us a chance to see what, what they might be interested in and a way to contact individual faculty when we see good resources in their areas of interest. Final thoughts. Never refuse an opportunity to take advantage of every opportunity you're offered to advocate for OER. Accept invitations to present at brown bags, invitations to talk to student groups, opportunities to present at webinar events like this. You might never reach everyone on your campus, but there's always a chance that you will reach someone new with each, with each presentation or event. We all have new faculty join our campuses every year, so you know you will at least have a chance with that group to reach out to someone who may not be familiar with OER or at least not familiar with the programs on your campus. Um, finally, capture your stats. As mentioned before, try to capture the names and interests of the people you talk to. Track program participants. If you have a grant program, try to keep a running total of the student dollars saved. This information can all be used to advance the program, to build support from administration, for press releases, and for information requests that come from news outlets like local papers and student campus newspapers. So that was just a quick overview. I really want to hear from you about um, what issues that you feel that you face um, with your OER efforts on your campuses. So if you have a question or have a thought, please put it in the chat box. What are the roadblocks that keep you from connecting with faculty? What are your strategies for identifying potential campus partners? And what challenges do you face when planning programs or presentations?
So I think Matt has put, we don't already know who is working at OER, and I think that is a major hurdle on every campus. Um, we have that same issue here. I spoke to a group yesterday and gave them kind of a rundown of who we know is using OER. Um, but I know there are others out there. We just don't have a good way of tracking it. We've worked with the bookstore um, so that when faculty, um, you know, request the books that they want to use for classes, they can put down that they're using OER. But generally what ends up happening here is they'll put down no textbook. So we have no way of knowing if they're using OER or if they are um, using library resources or if they're uploading something. Um, so we just don't know. Um, that's why I love Carrie's uh, uh, talk and um, the work that they did with their bookstore to get an ISBN for um, faculty members who chose to use OER. I thought that was a great, a great move there. I see Naomi um, says, early adopters are now becoming experts and advocates, but other faculty have no interest. Yeah, that's a great point too. Um, you know, you're just ne you're not gonna, you're never going to convince everybody. And one of the things that we always say when we go out and talk to people is that we understand that you know OER does not exist for every course, and not everyone wants to be Matt DiCarlo and write textbooks <laughs> that are openly available for students. But we just want um, the faculty to consider the possibility, just as they would consider the possibility of a um, traditionally published textbook. You know, we try to encourage them to consider the possibility of adopting an open textbook or creating their own textbook. So I, I, I hear what you're saying on that. Matt? Again said, uh, administrators are so fearful of potential mandates to use OER. If it becomes an official initiative, they are wary of academic freedom issues. Good point. And, you know, that can also be turned the other way around. Um, it can be seen as, um, you know, it, it's each instructor's academic freedom to choose the textbook they want. Um, mandates can be tough, and I know, you know, we've never advocated for mandates here. Um, I know um, in some maybe community college settings that they have specific plans to move all the courses to OER, but, you know, that's that's not something that, you know, we push or are interested in. We're just interested in people you know, having all the facts to be able to make the choices that um, they want to make. Cecilia says faculty here rarely involve librarians in selecting course materials. So can it, that's one of those things we can think about. Um, how do we get in? If you're a librarian, you know, you're working with faculty, that's one of those things I think where it's really important to get to know your faculty, to get to know your courses um, down your campus, to make sure you work with the bookstore, um, just so that they are aware that there are other options. So, you know, that I think that's when the team that works with OER can work with maybe liaison librarians if you have those on your campus you know, to make sure they have lists of resources that, that they can share with faculty um, to make sure good guides are available so that, you know, when they do have those opportunities, um, they can share that information with faculty. Jenny says, we had two great sessions, one for staff and one for faculty. Now, several weeks later, trying to get SGA involved for Open Ed Week, there is no activity. I have to let you know that although OER is part of my job description, I'm not I'm not getting I'm getting no backing from the director. I'm frustrated. Yeah, I could see how that would be frustrating. Um, all I can say is we've been lucky here because our um, dean is very invested in this. Um, we don't have a specific statement from university administration. We've heard, you know, word of mouth. They've, they've said they support it. 
Um, they've come out and supported, but we don't have any kind of written statements from the administration um, or even from the faculty senate. But, you know, those are things we're working towards. So it is kind of tough when you don't get a lot of support from the top. She also followed up a little bit later saying that they do have a campus-wide task force that has been meeting for almost two years with representation from A to Z. And so, um, I have no thoughts. Um, and so, and Naomi followed up, I guess, previous comments saying, yes, we have to become marketers just like traditional publisher sales reps. That's a good point. Good point. And, I mean, you know, we have to have, we have to be able to share quality materials, too. So, you know, like looking at the open textbook uh, library, for example, you know, if you can find resources that have reviews. You know, people are going to have different opinions, but I, that's one of the things I've heard from faculty as well. You know, the quality is not as good. But, you know, if you, you can find ways to back them up, then um, to back up the resources that you're um, sharing with them, then that would be great. We <laughs> inclusive access programs. We... Those are just starting to pop up on this campus, and the OER team has not addressed them directly. Um, we haven't been asked about them. And um, it's one of those things that we're still figuring out what's really going to happen with that here. What about others? Todd Charles um says that California has a bill, AB 798, to encourage faculty to adopt OER and affordable learning solutions to increase graduation rates and help students get better access to their course materials. I think it's great when states pass bills to help. Um, we don't have that in the state of Arkansas, um, so that's encouraging. Any other comments, questions that you might have for Elaine that, um, or maybe the group to help answer? I know we all sometimes feel like you're doing this alone and you don't have the support, and that's what, you know, part of the symposium is for, is to help gather that support that you can lean on others and get some insight on how they've handled issues. Similarly, so if you have any other comments or questions, feel free to submit them. Okay. Well, I'm not seeing anything being submitted right now. So, Elaine, if you, do you have anything else you would like to add? Oh, wait. Jason says, one of our deans sort of grabbed the bull by the horns by initiating talks with Apple and Cengage. Well, the library is having to play catch up a bit. And then Matt asks, do you all have an OER policy? And could you elaborate on what you mean by OER policy? You mean OER policy on campus specifically? or in the system, or we do not have an OER policy on campus at Arkansas. We do not. Do you have anything to say about the app or the thing, Gage? Mm -mm. <laughs> Okay. Okay. 
So, Jason, yeah, second in line, we just need some momentum, um, reluctance from faculty. Naomi says their campus has a no-low policy, no-cost, low-cost. And Matt had asked if she was in Connecticut, and Naomi said, yes, Connecticut. Um, I think that no low uh, policy is definitely a step in the right direction if we're talking about student affordability. Oh, great post. Thanks, Carrie. So thank you all for listening. Um, if you uh, have any other uh, topics for discussion or items for discussion regarding this, feel free to email us at oer at uark.eu. Okay. Thank you, Elaine, um, and everyone who participated in the chat. I know sometimes it's a little weird in that way, but we felt it was maybe easier than everybody trying to chime in at once. Um, you can always, as Elaine said, email at oer at uark.edu. I am going to change myself to presenter. Um, oh, if you after today, have any questions or you would like the recording link or file, you can email us at openedsouthsymposium at gmail.com or me directly at sjpierc at uark.edu. Um, you can also follow us on Twitter to stay up to date on any announcements and events at openedss. Uh, we will be uh, posting some things regarding the future of Open Ed Symposium in the next month or so, hopefully. Uh, but thank you to all the presenters and attendees for participating. I hope it's been a very informative and engaging webinar. Uh, for those of you who stuck around the whole two hours or three hours, um, thank you so much. And if you have, as I said, any questions, comments, feel free to reach out to me. Um, you can send any comments or questions. You have to the presenters to me as well, and I'll forward it on your contact information and get you guys connected. So thank you, and have a great rest of your day, and happy Open Ed Week.